be a lot of things happening. The Fed, of course, he heard that comment uh, out, out of Jay Powell that maybe it's not just monetary policy. I mean, sure, low rates help. You would know when your risk-free rate is near zero, markets are more tolerant of higher multiples, plus maybe other things happening. To what extent, at least for you guys going into your research, to what extent do you bake in ultra-low rates for an extended period, given where prices right now? What do I make of that information? I guess the most direct way is to incorporate that into an overall top-down valuation model, which gives us a sense as to whether markets are ahead or, or in tune with the underlying macroeconomic environment. Uh, the way we do that is we have a, a model that includes uh, the outlook for growth. Uh, we in include 10-year U.S. Treasury yields, which, as you said, are just uh, hovering around 1%. Uh, we have a variety of other aspects for our Asian valuation, which would include the S&P uh, valuation as well as money flow statistics. If you roll all that together, we just updated this, and our fair value for the region is about 16.2 times forward earnings. Uh, last night, we closed at 17.9. So one of the points we made is that we've had a very, very hot mm. start to the year, uh, a nearly record increase in January so far of up about 10 percent as of two uh, uh, closes ago. And so that suggested to us that markets were a little bit ahead of their ahead of themselves, and that could give some uh, risk of a correction in the near term, which perhaps we're seeing right now. And in your view, of course, MSCI Asia X Japan, you alluded to 17.9. A lot of countries go into that index. Uh, what leads that correction in your view near term then? It's fairly well distributed, but generally sort of what goes up the most tends to mm. tends to compress the most. So. The leadership so far this year has been places like Korea. Uh, we've seen um, the H shares in Hong Kong do particularly well, given the influx of southbound buying. Uh, Taiwan has done very well. So North Asia and India have, have, have done somewhat better, India particularly in the fourth quarter of last year. Uh, South Asia has lagged. So I, I would think that if there is some profit taking to take place, uh, places like Korea uh, and, um, and uh, offshore China would be two, uh, two pretty good candidates. So, Tim, if we do see a correction, do you buy the dip? And if you do, what are you adding on a sector-by-sector -sector basis? We are very clear in our view, both globally as well as in Asia specifically, that uh, dips are to be bought. Uh, the reason, of course, is that we think we have a very strong underlying macroeconomic environment of a strong global cyclical recovery that will flow through into earnings. And I think the key point, guys, about the increase in markets right now and their vulnerability to a correction is that they're overextended in terms of risk appetite barometers or sort of hot momentum, hot sentiment, and also in terms of valuation. As long as nothing else changes in the baseline view, when prices come down, that increase or that area you're worried about is self-amortizing. Valuations come down, risk appetite barometers go back to neutral, uh, which then gives a very good opportunity to re-engage in markets from the long side. So we definitely think that one should be buying uh, dips. And the parts of the market that we like really would revolve around value cyclicals. Uh, we think that we're in an environment where cyclical stocks will continue to do well. We obviously, of course, prefer ones that are cheaper rather than more expensive. So we've just updated, for example, the screen of value cyclicals. That would be one place to, to, uh, to look. Tim, I know you favor A shares as well. And we've seen, of course, mixed messages, certainly seems like mixed, mex mixed messages from the PBOC, their advisors, on liquidity conditions here in China. How dependent are Chinese equities on continuously generous liquidity conditions? Well, I'd say that equities overall, this is not just China, but everywhere, are certainly supported by accommodative liquidity conditions and, and, and accommodative monetary policy. Uh, there's no doubt about that. So certainly excessive tightening would be a risk for any equity market, which would obviously include uh, the A shares. Um, our view is that uh, policy in China is likely to be uh, somewhat on the more uh, constrictive side. Uh, we've been very clear, our economists have been very clear in that regard. And the reason is, is that China is in a position to take back some of the uh, extraordinary accommodation that we saw last year to support the economy simply because it has it performed uh, the best of all the major economies and, and they've got the room to uh, be somewhat more, uh, to, 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 to uh, reduce some of that policy stimulus, unlike other parts of the world, for example, Europe, where uh, that, that stimulus is very much required. 
So our view on policy, the bottom line here is that we don't think that China is going to go into over tightening. We think that they're going to calibrate the uh, uh, the degree to which they uh, reduce some of the fiscal and monetary support in a, in a measured manner. And if it turns out that that looks as though it, it could threaten uh, the economy, then we think that they will correspondingly moderate their um, uh, their 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 constrictiveness. So uh, overall, we think that that the market may trade down on this recent news. But again, we still would view this as an opportunity to engage from the long side uh, because we don't think there's going to be a policy error. OK, uh, Tim, last time I think we spoke to you, India was one of your topics on the back of an earnings story that you think is going to you know, continue to recover uh, for this year. Do you still feel the same way about India? And generally speaking, we are entering the first, uh, well, fourth quarter earnings season for the region. Uh, what are your general expectations for these results coming through? So, so far, just to uh, deal with India first, um, uh, the early results in India are, are encouraging. We've seen a number of beats. And actually, for the region more broadly, we're also seeing similar circumstance. So. Uh, overall, we've we're, we've seen about 10 to 15 percent of the market overall market report uh, so far, and over 50 percent of the companies are beating expectations. Uh, additionally, we're seeing consensus numbers being revised up about 5 percent from the lows last September, and we have a high frequency macro and sector uh, data driven uh, model which predicts how consensus will revise their earnings. We call it early earnings revision lead indicator, uh, and that's also pointing towards upward revision. So I think the broad earnings backdrop for the region is good and is supportive of the of the constructive view that we have. For India in particular, we still very much like it. We think it's going to have the biggest delta to recovery from the, from the virus. Uh, also because of the, of the extent to which the economy was compressed last year or was hurt by the, by the pandemic, we think corresponding, we will see a very sharp recovery in both aggregate macroeconomic activity and also in terms of earnings. So we're still very, very constructive. The only knock on India, so to speak, is that the market's done very well, valuations are extended. So, you know, there too, we can see some either time or price correction, but we still think that that's one which investors should take advantage of from the long side. Tim, just briefly, I want to get your thoughts on a story that, of course, is drawing a lot of attention for our viewers uh, and our audience more broadly, is the short squeeze, this reddit fueled short squeeze and the phenomenon around GameStop. What is your take on what is happening here? I guess there's, there's two aspects. I'll deal one uh, in terms of, of, of the broader U.S. specific aspect, and then maybe try to uh, uh, map that onto Asia, which is which is my particular focus. Uh, first, it just yeah. goes without saying that, that clearly we're seeing sort of the you might call it the revenge of the retail investor, where you know the U.S. was was typically viewed as a very institutional market, uh, and I think the rise of technology and um, and and very accommodative uh, monetary policy has facilitated a resurgence of higher frequency retail trading. And we've seen that perhaps to an, the, the most extreme example uh, in this, in, in, in the GameStop uh, uh, short squeezed, uh, which has is, which is really pressured many uh, professional fund managers. Uh, I guess the question then is, well, could that be repeated in Asia? And the answer is yes, to some extent, but perhaps not to as great an extent. And I th the reason we say that is that we've constructed a retail sentiment barometer for Asia and with individual ones for each market. Um, and much like in the U.S., we saw retail investor activity really increase a lot last year. Uh, and, and the one area which we're still quite extensive is Korea. Um, so there's no doubt that the retail investor has been, uh, I'd say, ahead of the curve uh, and has been a significant driver of markets. Uh, where there's a difference, however, is that the level of short selling that one can partake in in Asia is a lot less than the United States. For example, it's currently banned in Korea. And so you, know, you wouldn't have that same risk of, of uh, retail investors squeezing shorts in, for example, that market uh, or as you currently do in the United States.